these Christian philosophy debates, they were very important for European philosophy and European theology. And they're not very well known over here in the United States. And one of the reasons why is there's kind of a vicious circle. And it's kind of good that I have a chalkboard. I'm going to do this, this lecture uh, in part as lecture and part as, as soliciting answers from you. Um, how many of you read French? Nobody reads French? Well, just professors. Right. Adam should read French. Works on Blondell. One person reads French. It is kind of a dying language. Um, it's unfortunate, but you know, it's it's not as important, say, as Chinese or Arabic or, or Spanish these days. Um, so, if you want to do scholarship, what do you have to have if you want to research French authors? How do you do it? Have you has this, this class included any any French no. authors? No. It included some German ones, well, yeah. right? Somebody just talked about Ratzinger, um, now Benedict XVI. Um, how did you read Ratzinger? He does speak English, right? But he didn't write in English. Somebody had to provide a translation. And without that translation, how many of you read German? A few, yeah. Again, Americans, you know, we're not very... We're not very good at, at pushing languages. So if it's not available in translation, odds are you're not going to read it. Um, and if it's not available in translation, that leads to a lack of interest, right? If it is available in translation, now you can be interested in it. You can talk about it with other people. You can publish things on it. You can hold conferences because you're all on the same page. Um, if there's no interest, Who's going to translate things? So there, there's a, a lot of work out there in French, in German, especially in Italian and Spanish, that just simply hasn't been translated. Really brilliant, interesting, groundbreaking, philosophical, theological, historical, you name it. There's a lot of work out there that doesn't get translated. The reason it doesn't get, that is because of this cycle. Um, because it didn't get translated right away, people assumed it wasn't important. And because they assumed it wasn't important, Nobody else comes along to translate it. Um, at least as far as the Christian philosophy debates goes, my, my impetus for doing this was originally as a Blondell scholar. Blondell was, was very involved in these debates, and his early works had been translated, um, but his later works haven't. So I wanted to, to translate some of those things, and a friend of mine sent these things to me in the mail and said, uh, why don't you translate this stuff? So as I did it, I started finding more and more works um, pertaining to the, these debates. And um, here in the United States, there's sort of a standard line that you get about the Christian philosophy debates. They, they started in 1931, and they were over fairly quickly. The main people who were involved were these existentialist Thomas Etienne Josson and Jacques Maritain, and who were their, who were their protagonists, or their antagonists, uh, either rationalist philosophers like... Uh, Neil Breyer, or uh, neo-scholastics like Fernand uh, von Steinbergen. And that's it. That's all there is to the story. Blondell got a little bit involved, but really not that involved. And um, there's the end of the story. Well, the picture's a lot bigger. There were about 50 people involved in these debates. And they went on from 1931 to about 1936, when they start to peter out. Um, you guys are going to be looking at resource mode. Uh, theologians later, right? We right. touched on him a little bit uh, okay. already. And well, so you talked about Henri de Lubeck? We all? maybe spent just, just a little bit of time when we were in Ratzinger okay. uh, touching on him. Yeah, he would be it, further further along. Somebody influenced mm -hmm. by de Lubeck. Um, Henri de Lubeck is, is, is a young man at the time of these debates. He's sort of sounding off at the very end. So by the time that he's actually writing about it and summarizing it, we, we think the debates are over. But, so from 1931 to 1936, you have about 50 different people weighing in. Um, I brought along a few props, you might say. Be careful with these. These are very old. Um, this is Blondel's um, Problème de la Philosophie Catholique. Um, still not translated. Uh, probably not going to be translated for a while, unless people decide they want to do it. And this was, this is a, you know, 
a whole book that he wrote in 1932 and published on the, on the topic. Most of the English language scholarship hasn't read this. Um, so I'll, I'll pass this around. This was actually the second, this is the account of meetings at the second um, session of the Societe Thomiste. Uh, Thomas philosophers and theologians got together in Europe, mainly French speaking, some Italian, some German speaking ones, and they would get together and have these days of study at a place called Juvisy. And they had a theme. The first theme was actually phenomenology. Um, the Thomas were very interested in that. This time it was Christian philosophy. And uh, two of them made presentations. Some of them made impromptu presentations because it took up so much time talking. Uh, and they argued back and forth about this. So this is a really live issue. This is a, a viable topic for, for discussion. Uh, why would people argue about this sort of thing? Um, well, you know, the, the American context is different than the French context. Here in America, let's say you had to give a number. How many denominations do you think we have? It's kind of a trick question. Isn't it? Why, why is it a trick question? It's hard to count them to begin with. Right? But, and then there's all these splits that take place. Um, we're used to a pretty diverse religious setting. And it's been that way in America since the start. It's more diverse now than it was, was previously. But that's uh, part of our cultural landscape. In France, if you were Christian, you belonged to mainly one of two churches. You were either Roman Catholic or you were Reformed Protestant. You were Huguenot. And um, here in America, although in recent times the government has been fairly secularized um, and some, some administrations have been more or less hostile to, to um, religion, in, in America, for the most part, um, there hasn't been a lot of controversy about um, sort of stripping the, the, uh, the public space of religion until the last maybe 40 years. In France, that was taking place from the Revolution on. And the French Third Republic was very secular. So secular that Maurice Blondel actually couldn't get a job um, for the first two years uh, because he'd written his doctoral dissertation in a, in a direction that ultimately took it towards um, religion. And so they said, well, this is theology, this is not philosophy. Um, you can't be hired. And there was it was a state administration. If you wanted to get a job, it wasn't like here where you apply at different places. There was one monolithic state educational institution, and you either belonged to that or, or you didn't. Um, there were the, the Catholic institutions as well, but they were pretty small. Um, so there was this, this big push to sort of secularize philosophy. And a lot of religious philosophers themselves bought into this, um, in part because if you wanted to get a job, you had to be able to communicate with those who were not religious, um, and in part because they had different conceptions of philosophy. One of the things that comes out of this debate that's very clear is there's no one single conception of philosophy. Uh, and the conception of philosophy that you have is really going to have a huge effect on your view of whether Christian philosophy is possible, what kind of uh, relations philosophy would have with theology, and if theology is even a rational discipline. So from the perspective of some of the philosophers involved in the debate, just like you know today, some of the uh, philosophers around today, what you would be doing in this classroom would be pure godly work. Right? Uh, some people would say this is purely irrational, um, can't have any connection to intellectual culture. You guys are just uh, spinning your wheels. Other perspectives uh, take a very different line. And so that's part of what they're fighting about in these debates. Um, now, one of the things that I'm kind of curious, I, I've never actually talked about the debates with budding theologians. I've talked about them a lot with philosophers. And I think that theologians have different preoccupations than philosophers do. We philosophers tend to obsess quite a bit about um, the provability of things and whether we can make a strictly 
uh, rational argument without making any reference to, say, scripture or, or um, you know, the history of the church or anything like that. We, we like to try to make arguments that way, even though very often it's not possible when it comes to the matters of uh, philosophy and religion. Um, so what are the preoccupations that, that theologians have? Um, you're all religion <laughs> majors, right? Theology or religion majors? Is so... What is it that you? What is it that you intend to do with this? How does philosophy fit in? Why bother? With it? Okay, society and how society does not seem to be particularly interested in, in philosophy. No, they're not. But it helps us view their way of living and how they function in life. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, Society on, on its surface is not interested in philosophy. Society in its ground is conditioned by philosophy because everybody has a particular philosophical perspective on big issues. You know, um, and some of those big issues are ones that impinge on theology. Does God exist? Uh, many people have decided that question one way or another, and that's not just a theological question, it's also a philosophical question. What else would you care about in philosophy? Why would these debates have anything to do with your lives or your uh, profession as you're going to practice it? You may not for some of you. You're going to be just a biblical hermeneutic. Probably doesn't have much to do with your life, right? All you're going to do is explicate scripture. Yeah. I guess uh, philosophy influences language. And we have to use language to articulate our faith. So. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, that makes sense. I was actually kind of joking with you, though, too. Um, if you're doing scriptural hermeneutics, is philosophy going to be important for you? Um, well, think about some of the big scripture scholars of this century. Some of the ones who made huge impacts. Take Bolton, for example. Um, I don't know if you guys have studied. Did you guys study him? Not really Rudolph this class. Bolton? In order to understand Boltman, you have to read Heidegger, because Boltman was influenced by Heidegger. Um, in order to understand, who have, who have you studied in this class? You know, we focused on you know, Ratzinger, and then oh. we read, um, yeah. you know, who's, who's a philosopher? Very much a philosopher. Right. Yeah. We read some African theology, okay. and then ended up with Nicholas Lash. Okay. Uh, most recently. So, what would you? Uh, I mean, It'd be silly to ask, what would you have to read in order to understand Ratzinger fully? Because he's read the entire corpus of philosophy and, and engaged just about everybody because he writes a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, he's got an interesting book out where he dialogues with Jürgen Habermas about the nature of uh, reason and whether it has to be purely secular, whether religion has a role in society. So theologians are tied in with philosophers. Um, Seems to me the, you know, if I could just go ahead, jump in. Yeah. But why we would one reason we would be interested in it is the relation between faith and reason. Yeah. Uh, to, yeah, and, and if you think about that, um, let me use a chalkboard. Here. <laughs> and I can get more chalk. That's if they're not. No, there's, there's plenty here. Okay. Um, we often counterpoise these to each other as if they're two separate domains, right? There's the domain of faith, and there you have to know things through uh, revealed truth, you know, um, scripture. Um, those who weren't around when, when that scripture was written, you know, presumably through the actual Christ event, you know, seeing the guy, spending time with him, being influenced by him. And then there's reason, and reason is something purely uh, natural. You don't need faith at all in order to make it work. Um, but, but what is this? This is a particular philosophical perspective, isn't it? It's also a particular theological perspective. And it may be one that a lot of people assume. And in our society, it's sort of the, the de facto starting point. But um, if you're really doing good philosophy or good theology, do you make a lot of assumptions like that without spelling them out or without arguing for them or seeing whether they're actually the case? What do you think? Is theology just, well, I happen to think this, we'll go from there. 
see some head shaking. <laughs> what do you do? How do you tell whether this is actually a um, well worked out distinction, whether things are so cut and dry as that? What, what do you do? I mean, this is something that, as theologians, all of you will have to grapple with. How many of you have thought much about the divide between faith and reason at this point? Some are. Some are nodding. What have you made of it? You know, some people would say, as soon as you start doing theology, you're on the side of faith, and you may use reason a little bit to reason from faith, but that's not really using reason in its full extent. You buy that? Some people would say that over here is philosophy, and over here is theology. And how is theology different than just plain old religious life? Well, in theology, you begin from faith, and then you do a little bit of, or maybe a lot of, reasoning, but you all you always just begin from faith, and whenever it gets to a difficult point, and reason doesn't supply it, well, just, you know, just go right back to faith. And so faith becomes sort of like a, a stopgap, sort of like duct tape. Faith holds it all together, and makes it work. But it's ultimately um, not the same thing as, as what it is that you're trying to, to put together. Does that sound right to you? Does that, that jive with your actual practice? I don't, to me, uh, to me, I work with um, epistemology and theology lately. Mm -hmm. And Reinhard Huter and Paul Griffiths um, Yeah, reason and the reasons of faith. Yeah. Yeah. They talk about the faith, I think, helpfully say that it's um, you know, reason that has this ascent to an extra um, tradition or in this case, the gospel and the tradition of the church. Yeah. So that's, um, and I think what Aquinas talks about is in belief and faith as an act of both the intellect and the will. Yes. Yeah, which I think is a very helpful way of Ted talking about. So it's reason along with the will of assent mm -hmm. to an extra source of thought. And yeah. reason working within that. And Aquinas is, is actually within a tradition. Anselm says some, some similar things about faith without being as systematic as Aquinas does talking about um, different senses of the term faith. There's faith as belief in, and then there's faith as striving towards. There's a practical aspect of the faith. And uh, Anselm unpacks the, um, the uh, discussion about dead faith in terms of belief just on its own without actually having any sort of striving, any doing, would be dead faith. Um, now notice what he does in that. He takes a, he takes a scriptural passage or a scriptural idea, and then unpacks it. Here's something to think about. You can approach this on two sides. First of all, reason. Um, now, if you actually believe in God, and you actually believe in creation out of nothing, um, was reason around in any sort of human sense before God created the universe and human beings? No, right? I mean, reason was around in, in the sense that God is rational. But actually, within the Christian tradition, church fathers all the way through to people like Aquinas, God is reason itself. As a matter of fact, human reason is not totally rational. This is a point that, that Griffith actually, actually makes in his contribution in that, that book. Um, and our reason is, is a created reason. If you... If you accept the, the notion that there is a creation, you know, created by a providentially ordering, <laughs> loving creator, that's actually going to have effects on what you think reason is. So there's not even going to be a full agreement between secularists and Christian philosophers on, on what reason constitutes. What about on this side? Um, is, is scripture just a bunch of reveal truths that are sort of thrown out irrationally as starting points for us? Or, or can you think of any, think of the, the canon of Scripture. Is there any anything like philosophy in Scripture? Paul, Paul yeah. 
Paul talks. Paul actually makes some epistemological points about the nature of wisdom. Um, what else? There, there's, a, there's a whole set of Old Testament literature that we would call a what? The wisdom literature. And you know, were they? Did they have philosophical schools? You know, like Plato? Not exactly. Uh, but they're carrying out reasoning, aren't they? So there is reasoning within the, the ambit of faith. Um, now, if we go beyond just just scripture, and then we talk about you know tradition with a sort of capital T, um, all of that includes reasoning that's done within the ambit of faith. And there's a, there's what you could call a uh, this is probably a term that you came across dialectic, a back and forth between reason and faith. And if you accept that sort of understanding, reason can't fully develop unless it's brought into some sort of um, positive or, you might say, respectful dialogue with faith, or, or perhaps even a, you know, um, a conflictual dialogue. Sometimes even conflict can be quite good in that sense, right? Think of the book of Job. They hash things out. That's actually a book of philosophy, too, by the way. They're making philosophical arguments about the nature of the universe, about moral evil, about how things work. Um, they're trying to convince each other. Uh, on the other hand, faith is also tied in with reason. Um, what kind of creatures <laughs> did God make us? If we accept, you know, sort of the biblical creation view, what kind of creatures did He make us? Just like the dogs and crawling things. Or, we make us any different than that? Yeah. Big one. Right there. That's, that's a difference that transforms everything. Um, I was just reading, this is sort of an aside, I was just reading Clement of Alexandria's uh, Exhortation to the Heathen um, last week, and I, I'm a collector of passages about what it means to be created in the image of God. Like that's one of the things that I, I, I'm interested in as a philosopher, and as these passages, how do they interpret them? What does Aquinas say? Well, if God is rational, if we're rational, that's how we're created in the image of God. Uh, Rene Descartes, later in modern philosophy, God has infinite will, we have infinite will, that's how we're created in the image of God. Clement actually says, um, he talks about um, music, and he says that, um, I can't remember exact, that, the exact phrase, he says that uh, man is the image of God, human beings created in the image of God, were created to be um, sort of like musical instruments. Because God himself en engages in harmony and engages in music. Um, beautiful way to think about it. Do any other animals appreciate music? That we know, I mean, snakes, you know, the snake charmer. He's actually just <laughs> going back and forth, and the snake is bobbing back and forth. The snake doesn't appreciate music. How many of you have dogs or cats? The dogs. Go back and forth to music? Maybe. They, they, you know, yeah. they enjoy it. I mean, well, they respond to the Yeah, and we may be leading them. Maybe it's like a yeah. transitional emotion. Yeah, and, and, and they might dislike certain kinds of music if we play them too loud. Um, <laughs> you know, if we play them too close to their ears. But but they don't have that, that sort of uh, grounding. We as human beings are, are different. And reason is, is part of what we are. How we get to know everything. Again, if you accept a, a Christian view on things, how is reason not going to be tied in with faith? Um, so that, this is all just background for these these, these debates. Um, now, I'm going to make a transition and talk about some actual positions that people took on the possibility of Christian philosophy and the connection between theology and philosophy that were, were possible. Um, you have these people called rationalists in France. And here in, in America, we would probably just call them secularists. And this is a very broad stance that takes a lot of different forms. Uh, not everybody adopted the exact same position as Emile Breillet and um, Ludwig, uh, Liam uh, Brunschmick did in the, the debates. But you can see similar things being said even today. Breyer said um, there can't be any Christian philosophy, and, and why not? He's assuming 
a very rigid distinction between faith and reason. Um, he says, well, what would Christian philosophy be? There could only be two possibilities. Either it could be a philosophy that's proved by some sort of, he calls it a magisterium, because again, he's thinking in Catholic France, right? Um, and the magisterium in the Catholic Church is sort of the ultimate arbiter when there's debates about, you know, is this part of the faith, is this not part of the faith? Um, he chooses that term, but he points out that every religious community, if it's going to remain coherent, has some sort of body who decides. You know, somebody actually lays down the law. And so there would be some philosophical positions that would be acceptable and other ones that wouldn't. But would this be philosophy anymore? If, if philosophy is subject to some outside influence like that, well, then reason is no longer what we call autonomous. That means it's no longer getting to, to decide for itself. Really what you're just doing then is theology. You're not doing philosophy anymore. Um, right here. So that doesn't work as Christian philosophy. So he says, well, what else? Could we find any cases where Christianity has made some vital contribution to the development of philosophy? Or we're thinking about more broadly to human thought at its greatest. Um, or um, was, was there really something else going on? And so Rayer looks at a lot of different examples and he says, well, what about the church fathers in August? Well, all they're really doing is warmed over Plato through Plotinus. And they're kind of mixing in some Christian imagery. Um, how about Thomas Aquinas? Uh, Thomas Aquinas is just doing the same thing with Aristotle. He, there's, there's the philosophy part of Thomas Aquinas, which is the Aristotle, and then there's the, the Christian part. And there he's just doing theology, and, and that's not interesting. The philosophy part is just Aristotle with some, some extra faith stuff thrown in. Um, what about um, Christian philosophers in the 17th century like Descartes? Um, well, you know, how many of you have read Descartes at any time? Not too many? Yeah. You should read them. You should read the meditations. Um, because he is the founder of modern philosophy. And he is sort of the founder of the modern worldview that we live with. This view that um, human reason by itself, taking faith out of the mixture, can solve everything. If you just purify reason, get rid of all your prejudices, get rid of all your assumptions, you could find some starting points, and, and then from those, you could find out everything and fix everything. That was Descartes' project. And that was the project that carried through through the Enlightenment. Um, well, Descartes clearly not doing Christian philosophy then, because the Christian stuff in Descartes is just sort of window dressing. He doesn't actually believe in anything. Traveling somewhere, he was in a boat, and he's. Um, He's in with a bunch of Catholics, and they find out that he's a Protestant, and they, they, um, they're thinking about throwing him over <laughs> and drowning him, essentially. And so what does he do? Luckily, he has a rosary. He gets out his rosary and starts, starts you know, just, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's just playing with the beads. And then they leave him alone. Um, well, that was Leibniz. He was kind of a timid fellow. Descartes was in a similar situation. It wasn't, it wasn't about religion at that point. Um, he was in a boat, and they wanted to throw him overboard. Uh, take his money, so what did he do? He got out his sword, and he backed all these guys up. And he said, okay, we're getting to shore, and if, if uh, anything happens before that, I'm going to stick you. Uh, two very different attitudes. Descartes is very practical. He thinks that you can solve things, you know, just by looking at, at purely human attitudes. This should sound familiar to you. If you go in chat room, uh, where debates are taking place about whether religion has anything to do with ethics. Don't you hear things like this? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. There's an entire movement out there of people who think that um, religion has nothing to contribute. As a matter of fact, all it's done is cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. If you get it out of the way, now we can live a, a truly human, truly rational life. Again, they're assuming this, this very rigid divide between faith and reason. Um, Brunschweig, Leon Brunschweig, he, he adopts a different position. He's also a rationalist. And, and the, the take that he has is going to sound familiar to you too as well. Um, he says, well, 
I wouldn't understand myself or recognize myself if Christianity hadn't existed. Christianity has made a huge impact on our, our cultural, uh, cultural heritage. But what was Christianity? What, what was religion altogether? It's really just human rationality or the human mind expressing itself in an infantile way, in a crude way, it, it, through images. You know, eventually we get, we get past that sort of stuff and we become much more rational we strip reason of all of these silly, superstitious elements to it. So what he's saying is really everything on this side is just um, sort of prefigurations of what's on this side. And there he's like some other <laughs> philosophers, like Hegel. Uh, he's like uh, some of the secularists today who say, well, you know, it's not even really a question of whether religion is false. It's just, you know, it's not as advanced. Have you ever heard anything along these sort of lines? So Brunswick is, is, uh, is uh, taking that point. Um, so those are rationalists. Rationalists think that there can't be any such thing as Christian philosophy. Um, there were also some religious thinkers who thought that you couldn't have Christian philosophy. And Gilson calls them uh, theologists. And what would we call them over here in, in English? We call them fideists. Is that a term that you guys are familiar with? Fideism? Yes? Who, who, who can give some sort of idea of what that means to be a fetus? <clears throat> Anyone? Tertullian, maybe? Tertullian is a sort of classic example. Or, or um, Peter Damien in the Middle Ages. Um, Peter Damien said that even grammar was the devil's tool. Um, really, you know, for Peter Damien, anything other than prayer and the Bible you were treading on thin ice. Any, anything else is probably going to get you in trouble. And, you know, if the devil invented grammar, you know, what about philosophy? Oh, you better not do that. Um, and human reason is so weak, it's liable just to lead you into traps. So you, you better not use it. Um, where do you hear things like this? You've heard things like this, right? Yes. Where do you where do you see things like this being said? Probably not theology classes, right? So much. Or does it come up with theology classes? Is, is every single possible Interesting issue addressed immediately by Scripture so that we never need to use reason and we ought to distrust it and root it out. No. No. There are people who think that, though, right? There are people who have bad answers to that. Uh, well, that's theologian. And, and it can be very um, angry, like, like St. Peter Damien was, or Ter uh, Tertullian was, you know, he was pretty vehement about this. Luther kind of fits that, um, although Luther actually does quite a bit of reasoning himself, but Luther says um, some pretty crude things about reason, doesn't he? Um, and since I don't know, you know what the campus policy is about, about uh, crude language, I'm not going to say anything. Um, but you can look them up. And he says some pretty crude things about a lot of things. Luther was a very earthy guy. Um, so that's theologism or, or fideism. And you'd say, well, okay, two extreme sides, maybe you'd meet in the middle. Well, some of the people in the middle kept this middle, kept this divide. Um, some of the people that we call neo-scholastics, these were uh, thinkers in the Catholic Church who were primarily Thomists. They were influenced by St. Thomas. And they get their impetus, they really get underway after the, the papal encyclical uh, Eternity Patris, which calls for a restoration, not only of Christian philosophy, but, but of the philosophy of St. Thomas. And the way that they were interpreting Thomas um, was that there's, there's theology and there's philosophy, and theology is, is you know, higher up, philosophy is down here. Um, philosophy uses purely natural reason, and the philosophy of the Thomas philosopher should really be no different than the philosophy of anybody else. Um, 
because it's using pure natural reason, so if it's any good, it is going to be just as appealing to anybody else whether they, they have any grounds in faith or not. And they very much distrusted um, theology. They, in their view, as soon as you cross this line and start doing theology, the game is over. Um, so you might say, well, why are they doing Thomas in the, in the first place? Then? Why not just do John Dewey or um, Bertrand Russell or you know, some other more contemporary philosopher? Well, you know, Thomas was a, a great philosopher and presumably he understood a lot of things. And so we just have to recover them and, and, and uh, follow in his footsteps. And there were a, a great many books that were written uh, Christian philosophy or scholastic philosophy that were basically just manuals. And Thomas had the answer to everything. It was, it was very much, I would actually called it a, a fundamentalism of the Summa. Uh, Tom, you know, Thomas Aquinas' great works are called Summas. There's the Summa Theologica and the Summa Contra Gentiles. And you have some Thomists that think that you don't have to think about anything. Just page through these and Thomas has the answer somewhere. So, you know, Question, uh, you know, prima, prima pars, question 23, uh, article, blah, 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 blah. Um, here's the answer. Well, that's, does that even sound rational? These neo-scholastics were not philosophers at the top of their game. So let's talk about some of the philosophers who actually did have some, some, some good positions on Christian philosophy, who had some interesting now we've looked at the people who said you can't do it. Um, it has to be a dividing line between these. Um, and I'm only going to talk about three different philosophers. because I want to keep it nice and simple. Two of them were really good friends with each other, and they lined up against the other one. All three of them should have been good friends with each other, but there was kind of a failure of Christian charity going on between them. That, that, that's rather inexplicable because uh, Blondell is, in some respects, the philosopher of charity. And here we see him being uncharacteristically uncharitable towards Gilson and Moritain, and both of them are equally mean to, to him. And their positions are actually quite compatible. Um, they didn't think they were. There must have been some sort of weird personality conflict going on that I've never been able to really figure out. Okay, Gilson. Um, actually, all three of these guys have something in common. They are formed in the French secular philosophical schools. None of them go to Catholic schools. They, um, they all decide to go, for one reason, one reason or another, to um, the Ecole Normale in France, which at that time was just you know, viciously secular. You were a Christian, you were coming in for a lot of ridicule. Um, one of the things that Blondell heard somebody say that was sort of just taken for granted uh, as part of the attitude was, what does some obscure event uh, 1,900 years ago in some backwater of the Roman Empire have anything to do with philosophy? Uh, we're talking about the Christ event. Um, that was the prevailing view. And so these guys are getting formed, all of them, well, not all of them, two of them as Catholics. Um, we're coming from, you know, very strong... Uh, Catholic families, and have a good formation intellectual before they get there, um, they're, they're going right into the lion's den. And why do they do that? Um, Jill Sum does that because he says, well, it was the only place to do philosophy. Um, why does Blondell do it? Blondell has a somewhat grander scheme. He is going to, this is part of his intellectual apostolate. He's going to tackle philosophy from within and find ways to show it that it has to return to Christianity. Um, kind of an ambitious project. So Moritan actually converts to, to Christianity. He starts out an atheist, um, makes it to school, gets influenced by um, this, this uh, Catholic mystic, Liam Bois, um, who gets him to go to Bergson's classes. Bergson is not a Catholic. He's not even a Christian. He's actually um, a more or less secularized Jew. And... Um, but he's opening up philosophy, he's opening up metaphysics. Moritan starts to see that there could be something to it. He also meets this nice girl, Reza, in, um, in uh, that time, and then they, they both start attending these classes, and he converts. And now he becomes a, a major Catholic philosopher as well. So 
So all three of these guys have seen both sides. Yeah. Maybe could you just write their names up on the board in sure. case people may not know how to spell those? And get your correct them. Christian I do have a website that I've, I've created dealing with these debates that I'm going to show you a little bit later that I'll have come all of this as well. So, Gilson asks, um, was there a Christian philosophy? How could you answer this question? One of the ways you could answer this question is by looking at history. Were there any philosophies, he asks, in which if Christianity hadn't come on the scene and contributed some ideas or something to that philosophy, that philosophy would not exist. And you know, what's the answer if you actually look in a fairly unbiased way at history? Let's take St. Augustine. Let's assume St. Augustine is a philosopher. Um, could his philosophy exist if Christianity had not come on the scene? How many of you have read Augustine? Oh, okay, so quite a few. How many of you have read the Confessions and read um, the, the, either the, the chapter that deals with the will or the chapters that deal with time and creation towards the end of the book? Not too many? Um, so the question that you'd have to ask yourself, could Augustine have had the, the understanding of creation out of nothing that he, he unpacks and he works with, he applies reason to understanding, could he have had that idea just on his own? Or did Christianity contribute that idea to him? Well, you know, who is he influenced by? What, what, what philosophers is he drawing on? He is drawing on Plato. He is drawing on Neoplatonic thought in Plotinus. But is the notion of creation out of nothing in Plato? Has anybody read Plato's Timaeus? No? Uh, to drop a reading list for you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in Plato's Timaeus, um, this is actually where a lot of Gnostic thought takes off. God creates the world, but he doesn't create it out of nothing. He creates it out of stuff that's already there. He calls God the Demiurge. This is something that gets into Gnostic cosmology there. So Augustine got some ideas from Christianity that are very clearly from Christianity and that he works with. Um, think about another concept. Um, what does the Gospel of John and the letters of John tell you God is most fundamental? Right. That is a notion of God. Notion of, not only of God, but of absolute being. That you can't find in any philosopher prior to the coming of Christianity. Now, you could ask yourself, well, they could have figured that out on their own, couldn't they? Um, well, for some of the cases, maybe. Other cases, perhaps not. Um, maybe they could have figured out that God was well. Could they have figured out something like human beings were caught in a situation not entirely of their own making, which screwed up their intellects and screwed up their wills so thoroughly that they couldn't even figure out how to get out of that situation. And even if they could figure it out, they wouldn't be able to get themselves out of it. That's what we call original sin. Um, would philosophy have figured that out on its own? Let's say it did. Could philosophy have figured out that, well, Somebody would have to come along to fix this. And that somebody would have to be God and man. Yeah, probably not. St. Anselm comes kind of close to saying, yeah, you can have a rational uh, deduction of this, but not too many philosophers follow him in that. Um, as a matter of fact, Anselm is, is starting from faith. Yeah, he's a Christian philosopher. So... Gilson says, yeah, look, you can look at history and you can find cases where Christianity has, in fact, um, contributed things to the philosophy. Now, how can that take place? Here's where it gets really interesting. Um, 
Does faith by itself exist? Let's say we don't mean just in the sense of a, a bunch of words put together that we call the, you know, um, the Nicene Creed, which could be our Articles of Faith, or, or the Athanasian Creed, or, or the, the Apostles' Creed, or whatever you want. Um, when we talk about faith as belief, where does belief exist? Very good. Um, what about reason? Does reason exist on its own? Put God out of the picture, because yeah, God is reason, so God. Yeah, yeah. I think we have the ability to reason. We have an ability to reason. Right? Does it exist on its own apart from human beings, human subjects? Faith and reason are things that exist within human persons. And Gilson has a really beautiful passage that I'm going to um, refer to. He talks about, um, it says, philosophy and Christianity are concepts, and that they are connected together integrally in, in a human being. So he says, if there was a faith and a reason in us whose being was radically distinct from that of a thinking substance to which they belong, we could, we could not say of any one of us that they were actually a human being, a single human being. It's not that we have parts of us. It's not like the, the faith part is something completely separate from the reason part. They're united in the actual human being, the living, human, breathing subject who lives in history, has relationships with people, develops over time. Uh, no one, no single one of us is completely rational. No one of us comprises everything that you know falls under the, the term of faith. Um, so he asks, actually, at one point, he says, I would like somebody to show me this, this abstraction, a human being, in which these things would be completely cut off from each other. Uh, he's issuing a challenge that can't be met to the Christian philosopher unless they're deliberately compartmentalizing because their culture has told them to do so, their faith and their reason are going to be tied together. There's some dangers with that. Right? Substituting faith for reason when we actually should be reasoning. Substituting reason for faith when we should actually have faith as well. But Gilson has an explanation here of how this is possible. Um, now let's think about another guy, Jacques Moritain. Moritain thinks that his view on Christian philosophy is just in line with, with Gilson's. And um, Moritain talks about the distinction between what we could call, let me put it on the board for you. He talks about the distinction between the um, essence or nature of philosophy. And also what he calls its concrete state. Uh, now, when we're thinking about philosophy, we can come up with definitions, right? One definition might be something like it's the highest effort of the natural human reason, or it's the discipline that deals with the, the biggest subjects and does so on the basis of natural reason. Those are, those are arguable definitions of philosophy. That's the essence or the nature of philosophy for more time. Um, does that actually exist by itself? We, we have all sorts of abstract things that we can think of. Think of a perfect reasoner. Put God out of the picture again, because God would be the perfect reasoner. Um, is he the perfect reasoner? Come on. Are any of us the perfect reasoner? Do we do concretely existing things actually match up with the, the perfect ideal of them? No. This is an abstraction. Doesn't mean that it doesn't have any, any existence. You know, abstractions are abstractions of, of some sort of reality. How does philosophy actually exist? It exists in concrete historical 
States. So philosophy, as it's done here in the United States, um, in the early 21st century, is not precisely the same thing as philosophy done in France in 1700, or philosophy as it's done by Dominican friars in the University of Paris in 1212. Um, actually, it'd be too early, wouldn't it? Um, wait lost on that. So philosophy gets done in, in different concrete states. It also depends on the person. Again. If you don't have philosophers, you don't have philosophy. Same thing goes with theology. Is theology, it, can you come up with a, a nice definition of theology? You probably have some, right? Have you guys, what, what are some definitions? Of theology is what? Study of God. Okay, that's very broad. <laughs> Um, it's a good inclusive one. Um, a lot gets covered in that, though. What, anything more precise? Thomas Aquinas actually said it's talking about God. Right? That's, that's just as broad. Um, Sermo de Dei. Uh, anything else? The individual theologians that you, you study, you guys, as theologians, you actually exist, right? And if all those books, of theology, there's some worldwide cataclysm, you know, let's, let's imagine um, some sort of book-eating virus, <laughs> book-eating bacteria. It's all the books available. Yeah. The whole internet goes down. Now you guys are, it does leave one book, the Bible, right? Um, now you guys are completely on your own, resourceless. Um, you'd have to restart theology all over again, wouldn't you? Let's say you forgot most of what you do from classes. Um, theology would be in a different concrete state. If you guys weren't around and nobody else was doing it, no more theology. It would, it would exist potentially as an idea, as an abstract essence, but it wouldn't exist in reality. It's something conditioned. So now, philosophy, if it's done in a Christian environment, is going to be. Uh, done in a different way than it is in a pagan environment. There's going to be certain things that Christianity affords access to, like God is love. Right? A pagan philosopher might come across the idea that God is love, but are they going to ruminate on it? Are they going to get a lot of mileage out of it? Are they going to write whole books about it? Um, probably not. Christian philosophers have. Um, St. Anselm is one of them. And so if you think about it, um, the history of philosophy should be filled with examples, according to Josson Montaigne, of cases where Christianity has come through and faith and reason have been in a fruitful dialectic with each other, not as sort of things off on their own, but in human persons who had to make sense out of their experiences. Um, at the time that they were writing, again, they understood the very rigid distinction between philosophy and theology. The philosophers did not want to be doing theology. Does what we've been talking about so far with Gilson Moritan, does that sound at all like what you guys are used to thinking of as theology? Where you have ideas that come from Christianity, you apply the human mind make sense of them. You explore them. First, a lot of you are no, but now you're starting to say yes, actually. The distinction between philosophy and theology isn't so, so rigid as, as, as a lot of people make it out to be. In the early 20th century, um, a lot of things that we were calling philosophy, nowadays we actually call theology. Blondell is actually seen as a fundamental theologian as well as a philosopher. Josson and Morantin, as much as they really resisted the idea of being theologians, a lot of what they're doing kind of seems theological. Doesn't it? Um, now, Maurice Blondel is another guy. And actually, we're going we're to take a break in just a minute. I just want to introduce you to just a few themes. And then we're going to talk about Blondel's philosophy for the rest of the, the session. Um, Blondel was very critical of everybody. 
involved in this debate. He was critical of the rationalists, of the neo-scholastics. Why? Because they put this rigid division between faith and reason, and, and once you actually do that, the game is over. Uh, if you define things that way, then you can't come to a conception of Christian philosophy where these would actually be in some sort of relation to each other. Um, if you start out with that assumption, and it's an assumption, out, if you start out with that assumption that these are closed off spheres, you're done. Um, well, what about going to Gilson and more Italian? What about saying, well, you know, Christianity contributes these ideas, and then philosophy just sort of takes them in and makes it their own and, and runs with them? Is, is that okay? Um, Blondell says, not by itself. That, there's a little bit of confusion going on. There's some dangers in doing that. Your philosophy becomes less strictly philosophical, unless you do certain things. And that's where I'm going to leave you for right now. We'll take a, a five, ten minute break, and uh, then we'll come back and we'll talk about this notion of, of uh, an open philosophy, a philosophy of insufficiency. And we'll talk about where we're really going with this, the problem of the supernatural in going down. So, and if you have any questions for me during the break, you can come up and ask me, and I'll talk to you individually. And I'm, I'm going to get that website up for you, too, or Adam. Like I mentioned before, Blondel was a, a guy who grew up Catholic. He grew up in, in uh, Dijon, France. And, um, he had a fairly typical formation, bright kid. And he saw the direction that his society had gone. It had become very, very uh, secular, very, very... Deliberately anti-Catholic, Catholics were being excluded from politics, from intellectual life. And he thought that part of his calling, his vocation, he actually writes about this way, was to work within philosophy to show that philosophy cannot truly be itself, cannot truly be philosophical um, to the extent that it has to be, cannot realize what it's made to be, without engaging um, theology and without engaging Christianity. So a lot of people wrote his works off as what we call apologetics, which is sort of a reasoned defense of the faith. Um, you know, the idea is you begin from the starting point of belief, and then you never really you know, question that belief. You just sort of try to provide a bunch of reasons for it. Um, Blondel wasn't actually doing that. And he is... I would say he is one of the, the great philosophers of the 20th century. He's very underrated. He is, he, he is at least as profound as Heidegger. Um, and within theological circles, um, not so much in, 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 in Protestant circles, but in Catholic circles, he is um, as important as any other philosopher in the 20th century. His, his thought actually led to Vatican II through two different currents. He influenced what are called the Transcendental Thomas. So um, Joseph Marshall, first, who influences Karl Rahner, uh, one of the great uh, 20th century theologians. And um, Rahner is one of the, Rahner and the Rahnerians are one of the main groups at, at Vatican II. He also influences all, all the people that are known as um, Ressourcement or Nouvelle Theologie um, people. So Henri de Lubac, Ressourcement. A whole bunch of different uh, people are influenced by him. And um, so it's well worth studying. Blondel probably, you could say, pulled off what it was that he thought Christian philosophy was supposed to be. So I'm going to give you just a few traits. The, the um, uh, materials that I, I sent to uh, Dr. English to send out to you are mostly excerpts from Blondel. And... Um, they, they talk about a lot of interesting ideas. I'm just going to hit on a few of them. Uh, and I'm going to start out with his critical side. Blondell says that there's, there's two errors that would block the way to, to truly Christian philosophy. In part because they would make philosophy no longer what it ought to be. They would debase it. See, philosophy, like any other discipline, um, has its own set of norms, its own goals. And one of the goals that has always motivated philosophers 
is to think things out to the very basis, not to not to remain content with unquestioned assumptions. To actually, if there's a reality out there, you want to know it. That's what makes somebody a philosopher. Not the fact that they have a PhD in philosophy or you know um, call themselves a philosopher or anything like that. What really makes somebody a philosopher, according to somebody like Vogel, is this desire to know. And there he's you know he's saying the same things that other people like Aristotle and Hegel have said in, in their time. Aristotle says all men by desire by nature desire to know. The philosopher just ends up doing that more apparently. So. Um, Philosophy is also going to develop over time, too, though. Because if you really, really do desire to know, if you really want to understand things, you're going to engage with what's out there. So, you know, let's think back a little bit to say Thomas Aquinas. Um, I assume you guys are all familiar with, with him. What, how do we usually characterize him? He was uh, this great medieval thinker. What made him great? Other than the fact that he's in our history books. People talk about. Why was he great? He wrote big books. <laughs> That's not enough to make him great. <laughs> Coffee table books are big books. We don't say that their authors are great. So why is this guy Aquinas a great philosopher? Certain elements and then how he rationalized them out. Okay. That, that, that's a good way of um, thinking about it. He applied reason to things. And he, if you actually read through them, you, you see them. Uh, sometimes you, you might get fed up with them because you, you might be waiting for, okay, here's the end, here's the conclusion. And then he'll say, well, here's what I think after a lot of thinking about it. Ah, but let's think about it some more. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and why does he do that? Well, because that's that's what reason leads him to, to not be content with, with saying, okay, we've got the solution, now we can go home. That's coming out of love, love for knowledge. Um, what else does he do, though, that's, that makes him important historically? Yeah. Um, he sort of clarifies the relationship between like, the ultimate source of being and also the Christian yeah, you're you're trying on Aristotle and clarifying some of Aristotle. Very good. He's the first person to thoroughly work through Aristotle. It is, his um, teacher Albert the Great is doing so. Other people are doing so. But Thomas goes as far as you can into Aristotle and tries to see, as a thinker who believes and who is um, you know actually a practicing uh, Dominican friar. Who's saying the liturgy of the hours daily? Who's, who's got a very active prayer life? Who's living in, in common? He's, he's you know living as a Christian. He wants to know: Can this guy, this pagan Aristotle, can he actually have anything of, of value? And in order to know whether he has anything of value, you've got to actually go to the ground. You can't just say, hey, "I'm going to read a few books." He wants to read everything of Aristotle. He, he not only reads Aristotle, he writes commentaries on. And he distinguishes where he says, well, Aristotle's right about this, wrong about this. And he often uses Aristotle against Aristotle to do so. That's part of what makes him great. And what is he doing there? He's engaging with the thought available at his time. So if Thomas Aquinas were around today, would he stop with Aristotle? What do you think? Say, ah, hey, Aristotle, that's good enough. Don't need to read anything more. Who would who would he have uh, read? Who would be on his bookshelf? Very worn out. Maybe a Manual Kant, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> and actually, the, the really fertile Thomas were doing just this. They would bring Thomas's thought in dialogue with Kant, with Hegel, with. Um, Philosophers of today. Somebody who's a good good example of that is Alistair McIntyre, um, Notre Dame, still plugging away after 80 years. Uh, he's still pushing hard as a Thomist, um, engaging modern thought. 
So Blondell wanted to do something similar. He thought that philosophy, it couldn't stop with Thomas. Josso and Moritan were stopping with Thomas. The way stopping with Aristotle. They said, yeah, there's Christian philosophy, it happened in the Middle Ages, uh, we should mainly do that sort of thing now. Blondell thought, no, you know, modernity, um, we've thought a lot of new things out, we've discovered new things, we have to take account of that. We have to do what Thomas did, go to the ground, think it through completely. And then we can see whether philosophy really does need Christianity. We can see whether human intellectual life needs Christianity. Because uh, maybe it doesn't. Maybe the rationalists are right. Maybe that was fine for the age of faith, the Middle Ages, but we don't actually need it now. We won't know that until we actually think it all the way through. Um, so that's what he did. He thought that there were two things that were standing in the way of Christian philosophy. One was what he called conceptualism. And this he talks about is the idea that philosophy ends and begins with concepts, clear concepts. And so all you have to do is, is come up with some nice definitions, and now you can reason from them. They can be as complex as you want, but you're ultimately going to decide things in a sort of verbal way. You know? Let's say we begin from this definition. Faith and reason are two separate things. Um, they begin from different starting points. Therefore, faith and reason can't mix. It's the way a lot of people reason, isn't it? Is that good philosophy? Well, now would say no. Because you're beginning from a bunch of assumptions, using those concepts, and then reasoning uncritically using those concepts. Um, there are a lot of dogmas that are built into our culture like that. That Blondell would say, these are beginning from unquestioned starting points. So if you do that, that's not going to work for you. Um, so let's say you have an open philosophy. He talks about the need for philosophy to open up within itself. It's a beautiful metaphor. Philosophy has to open it, open up within itself an empty space where it can actually welcome the supernatural in. Uh, the supernatural in the, the determinately Christian sense, meaning what? The supernatural order, God, revelation, um, the infused virtues, all, all these sorts of things that make up Christian life. Um, philosophy can't just accept that stuff from Christianity by itself. Philosophy has to actually open up within itself a space for that. See, if, if the revelation or doctrine or ideas are just coming down from on high from Christianity, and then the philosopher is just supposed to take account of them, that means that philosophy becomes no longer autonomous, which means that it's no longer really philosophical, because now it's sort of unquestioningly accepting things. And that's not good philosophy. So could philosophy, could it do this? What's that? Could philosophy open up um, ground within itself for accepting something higher than itself? Well, this is what Blondell did in his work. And if you read his book, Lockstown, which is available in English translation, you will find him doing precisely this. What he does is he starts with the lowest levels of human action, and then he builds all the way up, and he wants to see, could human beings, could human reason by itself suffice onto itself? Could that be all there is? And what do you do? You actually have to do the experiment. You have to see whether everything could be explicable if you take God out of the picture, take Christianity out of the picture, take everything that comes from Christianity out of the picture. And what do you find um, if, you, if you do this in an open-minded way and you don't already you know, skew the game by making assumptions that, that rule it out? You find no. As a matter of fact, philosophy opens up all sorts of problems that it can't solve. This might be something that would turn you off from philosophy. Uh, people go into philosophy classes and sometimes they come out more confused than when they came in. That may be philosophy doing its job right. Philosophy should open up problems 
that the philosopher by himself or herself can't solve. Then they have to turn somewhere else. Where, where can they turn? Uh, maybe other philosophers. Yeah, but that's not going to fix the problem, is it? Uh, where else could they turn? They could, you know, but let's think about this sort of in, in, in uh, a higher and lower perspective. If, uh, if you're living a philosophical life, and you're really thinking things out, and you're spending time motivated by this love of knowledge, and you're, you're encountering difficulties that you can't quite make sense of, and you're thinking the great philosophical thoughts, like what's the meaning of history? What's the meaning of human life? What, uh, what types of life are better than, than others? Uh, what is the good? And you're not able to fully uh, figure these things out. What am I? What am I supposed to do? Um, what are your alternatives? Let's say you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna find your answers in philosophy. You're not just gonna throw away philosophy. Um, how might you go lower? What might you look to? What activities would be might get you out of that problem? Let's say you're gonna you're gonna you're not gonna find your answers in philosophy. You're not just gonna throw away philosophy. Um, how might you go lower? What might you look to? What activities would be might get you out of that problem? They might solve those problems for you in, in, in a way by just you know ignoring. Lose go ahead. I just this will just. Yeah, you could you could um, you could say uh, or, yeah you could become sort of a, a skeptic or a cynic and say these are all just ideas you know and once you start to accept that sort of perspective um, you still have the, the the problems how should I run my life what should I pursue what are you going to do <laughs> which direction are you you could watch TV and drink beer all day. Some people do that. That's a way to get through it, <laughs> right? Uh, after a while, the um, the rent has to be paid, though, and you know uh, you get bored with just watching TV all the time. I suppose um, you can pursue a life of pleasure. You know, you you can find ways to lose yourself. But you don't actually have to be a Christian philosopher to think about this. Heidegger actually thought these sort of thoughts. Um, he thought that modernity, Nietzsche thought these sort of thoughts too, thought that modernity had lost sight of it, you know, these great ideals. Philosophy had led nowhere. And so what should you do? This is what he calls the problem of nihilism. Um, what do you do when values have become devalued? Um, another alternative would be philosophy actually looks elsewhere. It humbles itself and looks elsewhere for answers to these problems. And when it does, it accepts things into itself, but it still works on them as philosophy. It doesn't reason doesn't go on a holiday as soon as it starts looking at faith, but it starts to become much more receptive, and it starts to say, "I don't have the answers to everything. This way of life is not giving me the answers to everything." Talking about it very like the uh, Ecclesiastics, like that. Yeah, um, the. Uh, the fundamental problem in Ecclesiastes is this guy has actually thought through a lot of stuff, and he doesn't—he can't make sense of it. Um, and you know, who is it in the the, the um, persona of Quola, uh, uh, sometimes of Solomon, and it's supposed to be somebody who belongs to this wisdom tradition, and they have tried to make sense of the fact. That what's what's the, the one thing that really sticks in their thought? In Ecclesiastes, um, chasing after the wind. Well, that's the part of the problem. That uh, it all turns out to be vanity. It all turns out to be chasing after the wind. What's the one thing that really bugs them? What's that? Evil's not exactly. Yeah. Why is it that you know? Not only am I going to die like a dog, like everybody else, even though I'm really bright and I've studied all these things, that it all turned out to be vanity. Why is it that? Um, there is good and there is bad. And somehow, good people get it, you know, in the neck, and evil people go unpunished. And he doesn't say there is no God because of that. He doesn't, doesn't throw 
uh, religion aside, it's just, this really does not make sense to me. Um, and you can tell that it bothers me. How does the book actually end? Does it end with a repudiation of, of, um, of faith? Or does it end by turning to us? I don't know. But I, I do know that there is still good in the, the The author doesn't reject the faith. Um, so, yeah, Christianity, um, well, this is this is before Christianity, the Jewish revelation is answering problems that are raised for human beings. Remember, philosophy is a thoroughly human way of life. It's, in some respects, almost the highest expression of the possibilities for humanity, <clears throat> the intellect, the life of, of the mind. Um, but then you may find out, and this is what Wandell is saying, philosophy, if it's really doing itself right, will find out that it isn't the time. That it has to look to something else. And now the way is open for Christian philosophy. This is where we have the problem of the supernatural, as, as he calls it. What is, what is the problem? How can human culture, how can human reason address itself to something which turns out to have been addressing itself to humanity long before humanity even started to listen? Uh, how can it take in something that's greater than itself? How can it uh, engage the, the infinite without losing itself in the process? How can human beings, um, in what's greatest about them, in, in what God made them to do, to think, to, to know, to, to love through knowledge, to pursue knowledge. How can that turn to faith without, therefore, without thereby losing itself? That's the problem of the supernatural, that he says. And he says philosophy has ignored this. And, you know, if you think about where we are today, and you think about... Um, where Blondell and his culture were at that time, were really in the same position when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to culture in general. Imagine philosophy as sort of the apex of intellectual culture. Um, most intellectual culture that we see being generated in, in our society is um, closing on the, the door to, to um, not just theology, Again, what's, somebody said, what is theology? Theology is study of God. Thomas said, talk about God. Ultimately, theology should refer us beyond to something which is supposed to be ultimately great, ultimate reality. It's supposed to open us up to what truly is. And society can be structured in such a way that its highest intellectual products actually close us off to Blondell thought that, and again, this would be why Christian philosophy is, is relevant, really what philosophy ought to be doing is opening up those doors instead. Um, now, how, how would this have to do with you as not, you're not philosophers, you're theologians? Um, well, again, think about when you're doing theology, are you using philosophy? Where are you going to get your philosophy from? How many of you are planning on going on for more advanced studies in theology? Okay, so while you're there, you're going to have to study some philosophy classes. You have some here too, won't you? Do the, they have to study some philosophy classes as part of their formation. So if you're going to use some, some theology, those theologians, they studied philosophy. How do you know whether their philosophy is, is really good philosophy? Yeah, you do philosophy to figure out whether philosophy is good philosophy. Uh, you take some people as your guides, too. You, you want to pick um, guides who, actually some of them may not actually be Christians, too. You know? uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, a lot of 20th century philosophy that was done in, in Europe is actually um, very radical in the sense of, of turn towards the, the, um, 
the left intellectually. And it's about you know, liberation from this and liberation from that, and critique of this and critique of that. And some of that can be quite valuable. Um, I, I wouldn't you know, want to buy into those, those projects wholesale. And, and you can look at the roots of some of those, those uh, philosophers. You could think of, say, Nietzsche, for example, or, or Marx. And uh, Nietzsche and Marx, you wouldn't want to um, necessarily buy into their projects wholesale. You couldn't be a Christian and do so. Um, you know, because you know, Marx says not only religion is the opiate of the masses, he says that, that um, religion is a form of false consciousness. So, you know, thinking that Christianity is true and being an Orthodox Marxist, they're just not compatible. But you could take a lot from Marx in order to do philosophy well. You could take bits and pieces of those critical aspects to try to open up gaps. Um, Blondel was doing that. <clears throat> so now, interestingly, Blondel was very, very key to make sure that he was not doing theology. Because if you were doing theology, you could get in trouble. If you're just doing philosophy, um, then you're just doing philosophy, and, and they may not like you, um, you know, talking bad about Thomas Aquinas or something like this. This is the time that Thomas Aquinas is sort of, you know, the guy who ruled the roost. Um, but if you were doing theology, then you could you could actually be censured for that. So he made sure to say, I'm I'm always just doing um, uh, philosophy. What do we call him today? we actually call him a fundamental theologian. Fundamental theology is that branch of theology that looks for the, um, the conditions for the acceptance of the bush and what has to be there in order for the human being, the rational human being, to open themselves up and to accept the word and to be in communities and, and for this to have some sort of effect. Um, there's actually an interesting book out there by Carl Rahner called Hearer of the Word, which does precisely that, and it's very indebted to Maurice Blondell. Um, and so ultimately these things about Christian philosophy, they have a lot to do with theology. Um, so now, uh, this would be a good time, how much time have we got left? Probably not much. Yeah, we're about. Do you have any, do you have any questions? Complaints? <laughs> Criticisms? Could you? Uh, I think Josh was asking maybe for some resource for some resources. I mean, could you maybe just point us off the top of your head to a work or two if we wanted to read more, especially thing of an introductory. Having for, to do with uh, resource or having to do with Christian philosophy, or I guess Christian philosophy, uh, or either one. I guess if you could find us. A way in from an undergraduate point of view. Uh, would you recommend something? I'm putting you on the spot. There may, there may not be um, such an animal well, out I there. I would actually, one thing I would actually recommend to most of you is um, reading Blondell's book, Axiom. Hmm. Um, it's a really great piece of philosophy. Um, the one problem with it is that he's engaging a lot of philosophers and does not footnote who he's actually engaging. So that, that's kind of a problem. But um, for later resourceful thought, um, the guy that I actually like the best is Henri de Lubeck. But mm -hmm. then which book of his to to pick out? You know, he wrote a lot. We've read uh, Discovery of God. Okay, with yeah. Undergraduates and it's. Works very well. He also has a book, I forget the title, but it's about contemporary forms of atheism. Right. Modern yeah. atheism. And that's a good one because it's a lead in to all these sort of historical uh, developments. Hmm. And it gives you an idea of why, why we can't just regurgitate Thomas Aquinas, why um, we, we have to. And Luke de Lubach loved Thomas Aquinas um, more than Blondell did. <laughs> um, it gives you a good idea why we have to think of these things somewhat differently in the modern period. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that would be a good start. Um, there isn't any, as far as I know, there isn't any like single volume yeah. 
book about the source among theologians and philosophers geared towards undergrads. That could be something good to write, actually. I, could, I guess Fergus Carr's 20th century Roman Catholic theology, isn't there? He does some of that. Yeah. Uh, but it's broader than just that. There's, ah, there's a lot be. of different could be. texts like that. So the other... Well, let's uh, give a round of applause to...